Unless you're lucky enough to own your own home, you've probably noticed an irresistible force eating away at your money. No, I'm not talking about your Greg's addiction. I'm talking about your landlord. If you only entered the housing market in recent years, private landlords and sky-high rents might seem like the norm to you, but it wasn't always like this. The current situation was brought about by a series of political decisions, made over decades, and can be reversed, giving everyone access to low-cost, high-quality housing. But before we get into that, let's examine how bad the situation really is, and how we got here. In 1914, as World War I was starting, 90% of the UK's housing was owned by private landlords. To stop profiteers from hampering the war effort by making people homeless, the government introduced rent controls, capping rents at their 1914 levels. These rent caps remained in place after the war finished, however, while the government embarked on a huge-scale housebuilding program. The poor health of the troops during the war had scared the government, who decided that it was time to fix the overcrowding and poor quality of Britain's housing. This need was made more urgent by the socialist revolution that had happened in Russia in 1917. The poorly treated working class there had overthrown first the Tsarist monarchy, and then the pro-capitalist government that followed it. This unthinkable turn of events so unsettled Britain's ruling class that the Foreign Office tasked Winston Churchill with organizing a military intervention in Russia, in support of Russian rebels. The idea of working-class revolt was now a real possibility in the minds of European elites. At the same time, there was a general consensus that the private sector would never be able to house Britain's population adequately, and that the state would need to intervene if we wanted people on lower incomes to have good quality housing. As a result, the government built a million council houses between 1918 and the start of the Second World War in 1939. Right from the start, however, some councils were deeply unhappy with the idea that the government should provide housing, and looked into selling the new houses as quickly as possible. But since the Treasury was subsidizing most of the building, councils were obliged to get permission from the Ministry of Health if they wanted to sell the properties, and the Ministry usually refused to sell at a discount. As a result, most of the new council housing stayed in local authority hands. Though the Second World War interrupted building, local authorities and housing associations continued to build social housing at an impressive rate, with 4.4 million more social housing homes being built between 1945 and 1990. At the same time, it became easier to buy a home, because incomes increased in real terms, mortgages became more widely available, and house prices remained low, because the rent controls encouraged the capitalist class to invest in other areas instead. By 1991, only 10% of people lived in private rented accommodation, compared to 90% in 1914. Clearly, implementing rent controls and building social housing were massively successful policies. But the rental markets changed since 1991. Now, 20% of us live in private rentals, rents are higher, and the situation's only getting worse. So what went wrong? Many times, when people try to explain this, they point to the right to buy scheme, which gave council housing tenants the right to buy their homes at a discount. That has certainly helped to speed up the process, but, as we're about to see, the real problem was the total removal of rent controls, which the government completed on January 15, 1989. By the time the Second World War was over, the immediate concerns that had led to rent controls being introduced were long past. Though Britain's empire and much of Europe were weakened, the world seemed to be settling into a new, peaceful order. Working-class revolutions hadn't seized power from the European capitalists, and many from the UK's working classes were now living in good quality housing. Those factions, largely within the Conservative Party, which had never been happy with the government providing housing, started to win control of the debate, and they won their first concession on rent levels in 1957, when the Rent Act saw previously controlled rents increase, based on current property values. A decade later, the free marketeers won another concession, when the Rent Act 1965 created government-employed rent officers to decide on fair rent levels for each property. Rents could now rise alongside prices and wages, ensuring that inflation didn't eat into landlord profits. Despite this, the percentage of private renters in the UK continued to fall. Easy access to mortgages and a steady supply of affordable council housing gave people better options, while the limited profits allowed by rent controls, and the lack of a desperate consumer base caused by previous housing shortages made the rental sector unattractive to potential landlords. Meanwhile, though, 
the anti-council housing faction were fighting for more than the removal of rent controls. They were already laying the groundwork for selling off the country's social housing stock. The Housing Act 1952 removed the legal requirement for local authorities to achieve the best price at sale, allowing those councils which wanted to, to start selling off their social housing at a discount. By 1974, the right to buy scheme was largely in place, but economic conditions meant that it wouldn't prove useful until 1979. In the following two years, the Conservative government sold over 100,000 council houses by offering steep discounts, marking an increase in sales of over 500% compared to previous years. After the right to buy scheme was formally introduced in 1980, the government continued to sell off the country's housing stock at a rapid pace. Sales went up whenever they increased the discount, and down whenever they decreased it. With discounts reaching as high as 70%, many tenants were tempted to buy. This is where we reach the problem with the usual narrative that right to buy is responsible for the increase in private landlords. Because, while the, the government continued selling off the nation's social housing over the next decade, the number of private rentals continued to hold steady, at around 2% of the population. It was only after 1990 that the percentage of private rentals started to increase. And what happened on 15 January 1989, just a year beforehand? The government binned rent controls, that's what. If that had never happened, the overwhelming majority of houses sold to tenants would likely have remained owner-occupied. Without the ability to charge high rents, there wouldn't have been any incentive for people to invest in property, and the lack of competition would also have kept house prices down, which would have made it easier for more people to buy their own homes. Today's vicious cycle of extortion at rents and rocketing house prices could, instead, have been a virtuous circle of controlled rents and affordable mortgage payments. But how big a difference could this have made to people's lives? Even with our sky-high house prices, the average homeowner only spends about 18% of their income on housing, compared to 40% for tenants in private rentals. This 22% difference is a direct transfer of wealth from the tenant to the landlord, and to the bank which holds the mortgage. Even if you don't see a problem with exploiting people who can't afford to buy a home, this should still concern you, because it's swallowing up our tax money. Due to the dwindling social housing stock, people in receipt of housing benefit are increasingly being forced into expensive private rentals. And the government can only cap housing benefit to a certain extent without creating a tidal wave of homelessness. Many of the free marketeers argued that deregulating the rental market would incentivize house building, by making it more profitable for landlords. But they seem to have overlooked the fact that before rent controls were introduced, Britain had a housing shortage, with many people living in poor quality slums. It's hardly surprising that we're returning to that situation now that rent controls have been removed. Rent controls are never popular with the moneyed classes, since they remove an opportunity to profit without working. As a result, we hear many people scoffing, and saying that they don't work, whenever rent controls are mentioned. Today, one actual obstacle to implementing rent controls is the fact that so many people are relying on their homes as assets, banking on them increasing, or at least retaining their value. Clearly, if we implement rent controls today, we have to be careful to find a balance between suppressing rents and harming the wealth of people with large mortgages. But the same can be said of the other measures proposed to bring rents and house prices back down to earth, such as mass house building programs. Perhaps the biggest obstacle to implementing rent controls though, is the fact that most of our MPs are wealthy themselves, with one in five of them being a landlord. In our broken political system, money gets its way a lot more often than the concerns of ordinary people. But that's a topic for another video. If you've enjoyed this video, then remember to like, subscribe, and share. I can't promise you videos on a regular timetable, because my health isn't great, so their release will just have to come as a nice surprise. Until next time.